year joined by Professor Jan Hagen. Uh, Jan, thank you very much for joining the session today. <laughs> thank you very much, yeah, for being here. Yeah, we're very much looking forward to your lecture. Uh, but before that, just some uh, housekeeping information. So after the session, we will have a short Q&A session. Uh, in order to have your question uh, answered, you need to use the Q&A section here uh, on Zoom. So on the bottom of your screen, there will be two balloons with the Q&A uh, here where you can open and type in your question. Uh, you can type in at any minute, but we will get to the uh, questions uh, at the end of the session. So just a small uh, introduction here. This is what we are looking at today. So we will have the lecture with Professor Jan Hagen. After this, I will do a short introduction of ESMT, uh, the four MBA programs that we currently offer, and then final, uh, the Q&A session. Uh, so Professor Jan uh, joined ESMT's faculty in 2005. Uh, his interest in research is to understand how organizations deal with human errors as well as automation errors, how psychological safety can be established in teams, and how managerial practice can support a culture of learning in organizations. He has published two books that focus on managing errors in organizations. Um, and as well, his research has received media coverage and outlets like the BBC, The Economist, Financial Times, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, The Guardian, Forbes, uh, and so on. Uh, Jan's personal interest is in interacting with organizations to transfer academic knowledge to management. Uh, and this particularly applies to his research with high uh, reliability organizations like the airlines and the military, which has implications for business leaders wanting to create agile learning organizations. He is also the program director for ESMT's Leadership Under Pressure Executive Program, and his executive education teaching portfolio includes program for, among others, Allianz, Belgian Air Force, Daimler, Deutsche Bank, European Investment Bank, European Parliament, German Federal Armed Forces, IBM, and Lufthansa. Uh, if times allows, he also support companies as a consultant with regard to error management. So. Uh, I think after this introduction, we are so excited uh, for your lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Jan. Okay, thank you very much, Marina, uh, for that kind introduction and uh, long, uh, sorry, um, basically um, what, what I'm uh, looking at is um, communication in teams, interaction of teams. Uh, and uh, how they communicate, uh, not the good stuff, because that usually gets out pretty easily. But about the bad stuff, and that is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, extremely important in high reliability organizations like uh, nuclear power plants, airlines, and so on. So that's my focus in research. Uh, in today's lecture, I will briefly um, uh, give you a glimpse on what that means and how we can transfer that maybe into uh, management and why it is relevant for managers, not necessarily working in high reliability organizations, but in other organizations. All right, so um, let me start with sharing my screen and then we can jump into the topic. And if you have any questions, uh, I think it's fine. Uh, we have the um, chat function open, right, Marina? Yes, we do. Yeah, okay, so uh, if you'd like to put in any, anything in the chat, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, otherwise, I will um, browse through the presentation and um, we'll have uh, time for Q&A later on. So what is it uh, uh, when we think about managing errors in organization? Well, uh, first of all, it sounds pretty easy because when something goes wrong, we often look at what is wrong. And uh, most of the times, it's not serious stuff, so we can correct easily. And in basic terms, you can uh, say, we learn from errors. And, and there's a very nice uh, quote here, um, which was from a tea bag that my wife uh, once found, and she gave it to me and basically said, well, Jan, you do errors and so on. Isn't that something that um, belongs to your research? And uh, it, it's written here in German, 
um, uh, which means take an error as a step towards success, which I think we can all subscribe to. Yeah? When something goes wrong, we learn and next time we do it uh, better. But the question is, is it really that simple what we have here? Yeah? Is, isn't there maybe a little bit more to that that we have to think about? And uh, to highlight that, I'd like to briefly uh, provide you with um, an example from the airline industry. It's a Lufthansa flight uh, that happened uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, nobody died, but it was a serious incident uh, and uh, that unfolded briefly after takeoff. So the plane is pretty heavy, yeah? lots of fuel, lots of cargo. And uh, just after takeoff, the pilots were confronting with a, a problem with the airspeed indications. Um, and um, they basically thought their plane was getting slower and slower and uh, therefore tried to uh, lower the, the climb angle uh, to uh, increase the airspeed and um, uh, deal with that problem. However, it turns out actually, it wasn't uh, an airspeed problem, it was an indication problem that they had in the, uh, in the cockpit. So the plane was actually accelerating normally and, and once they did their trained emergency maneuvers, actually there's, they were going almost into an overspeed uh, situation um until they realized uh it was not a real situation but it was just an instrumentation problem now pilots are also trained for this yeah so uh they train uh, they they uh, declared an emergency uh and uh, continued their flight uh um outbound of frankfurt and dumped about 60 tons of fuel here in the northern area of frankfurt and then returned within an hour to frankfurt and landed without further problems so far, so good, nothing happened. But once the plane was on the ground, the investigation started what caused the instrumentation problem because that was um, something that had to be investigated. Uh, that's something that's required by law and also Lufthansa wanted to figure out what was the problem. So they uh, looked at the um, uh, air data modules that provide um, uh, basically uh, data that comes from the sensors outside of the plane um to the instruments and it turns out that the lines that connect the outside sensors to these air data modules were not connected this is here the uh the red circles and um, the question is why did this happen was it sabotage at play or was there something else and it turns out actually it was not sabotage it was actually a miscommunication during maintenance because there were two maintenance teams working one team was working on this main system. This is what you see here. And then there was a second team. Yeah, so this was team number one. And the second team was working on the standby um, system. And the problem was that the team number one thought that the team that was working on the standby system would have to dismantle uh, their main uh, lines that they were working on. And once their work was completed, that they would connect all the lines back in. Now, the problem was, as you can imagine, that team number two had a different process description, which meant they were um, never meant to touch these uh, main systems and uh, therefore did not uh, connect. So the main problem was with team number one. Yeah? So they uh, didn't complete their work as, was supposed, uh, as they were supposed to do, but uh, done in a different way. Now, what can you do? Yeah? Uh, well you might do something like this, fuck up nights. This is something that is pretty popular in, in the startup scene. You talk about bad stuff that happens and you learn from that. That's that's the idea, yeah? success through failure. Now, uh, sounds nice, but if you think about a hospital talking about medical errors, an airline talking about serious maintenance problems, that's probably not what people like to hear. And in the airline industry, actually there's some, something else at play. Because when you have these kinds of errors, that might lead to airplane uh, crashes. And in this case, actually this, this maintenance case, uh, we have three airplane crashes that uh, were actually coming down because of the exact same problem that the pilots were focusing, unreliable airspeed indication. Uh, the first two that we have here, the Bergen Air and the Aero Peru, were caused by maintenance problems, similar to Lufthansa, slightly different in the way the thing happened but the outcome was exactly the same as with Lufthansa plane. The last one 
uh, is um, Air France 447. Here it was not a maintenance problem, it was a uh, meteorological problem that led to icing of the sensors, but the outcome for the pilots was exactly the same as for the Lufthansa pilots. They lost uh, critical airspeed information and all three crews lost control of their aircraft, which led to a crash of the plane. So we're just talking about serious stuff here. The question is, how should Lufthansa react to this? Yeah, should it be fuck up noise or should it be something else? Now, I don't know what, what you think, but usually when, when I have this lecture, that would be a good point for starting a discussion. What are the options that you have? Now, um, in this case, let's, let's jump a bit forward and look what Lufthansa did. And Lufthansa took very harsh actions. They fired the engineers, not, not all the engineers, but the engineers that were working on the main system, the number one. Uh, and uh, the idea of, of the Lufthansa action was basically they have to, they identified a bad apple in their organization, or if you like, two bad apples. Yeah? There were two engineers, and they fired the two engineers because they didn't adhere to the pro uh, procedure that was mandatory for working on that aircraft. Now, why I'm showing this example to you, the reason is quite simple, because when we talk about errors in organizations, we have to keep in mind that um, the tolerance for failure, the tolerance for error, depends on the kind of organization that you work in. What we typically have is when we operate in environments with high level of uncertainty, like uh, in innovative or research environments, we have a relatively high level of failure tolerance, simply because we work in unknown environments. And failure in these environments is quite natural. Yeah? If you think about basic research in life science, uh, if you think about a company uh, working on new medications, it's quite often that they uh, end up uh, with uh, negative results. Does it mean they should stop research? No, because when you when you uh, fail here, you have a learning that's necessary for improving, and therefore it's acceptable. But the more we move to the right side here, the less failure tolerant we get. Yeah, and uh, if you think about banking. Uh, it's okay and for banks to have losses on their loans in the region of five, maybe even 10%, but definitely not 50%, then they would go out of business. So that's something that's required. When you think about the margin sensitive manufacturing, here we have failure tolerances 10 to the power of minus three. If you think about some uh, more specialized industries like car industry and so on, they go to 10 to, uh, to the power of minus four, or minus five. So this is uh, the acceptance there. And if you finally think about high reliability, like a nuclear power plant, you don't like to have a nuclear power plant blow, um, being blown up every year. So here the failure tolerance is extremely high and the aim is to go for 10 to the power of minus eight. Now we can debate whether they achieve that, but that should be the aim that we basically should not have in the foreseeable future uh, errors in these kinds of industries. And the same goes with airlines. When you enter a plane, you don't like to think about crashing, but rather, is it on time or not? Yeah, this is the way we think. So here, we pretty much know what we do, and therefore, nothing bad should happen. But then there's a second thing that we should keep in mind, and that goes to the nature of, of the failure, nature of the error that we are looking at. And here we can basically uh, differentiate three types of errors. The first one that we think of, and that is connected to what I showed you on the left-hand side of my uh, previous slide, is basically an intelligent failure, like in, in um, pharmaceutical research, yeah, where you uh, create new med a medication, which goes into clinical trials and sometimes fails. Sometimes it seems to fail, but then if you tweak it a little bit, if you learn, you actually can make it a success. And Alimta is a, is a cancer medication that's fine, probably a little bit too specialized, but you probably all know Viagra. And Viagra was first thought to be a medication for lowering blood pressure, but it failed in clinical trials. But during clinical trials, they had another observation, which led to the uh, to a different use of the medication, which was then usually profitable for Pfizer. And here we have this typical motto, fail fast, learn fast, improve sooner. Very appropriate. But then we have a second type of uh, failure, and that's a complex failure, where we basically know how different things interact, but um, uh, sometimes they interact in unforeseen ways. 
And a typical example is the A-class of Mercedes, which has a high center of gravity, which was never a problem doing standard tests. But when the car was sent to uh, Sweden, uh, there they have a particular test that they only do in Sweden, the ELK test. And here it showed that the car, because of the high center of gravity, had the tendency to flip over. Now the initial reaction from Daimler was, well, no problem. We don't deliver it to the Swedish forest. You will never see an elk with this car. But the problem was still evident because you can also have evasive critical maneuvers in cities. Yeah? And therefore, uh, Daimler had to deal with that. And the answer for Daimler was, well, use uh, a technical component called ESP, which stabilized the car and made it successful. And this is the second element here. So uh, yes, we learn. But we also think about mitigation, mitigate the con uh, consequences of these things. But then we have third category of, of um, failures, and these are the preventable failures. And this is what we saw in Lufthansa. Basically, everybody knew what to do, but for some reason, uh, they didn't do it. And the idea with preventable failures is, well, just prevent them, yeah, because we know what, what is necessary to do. But the question is, is it really that simple? And the answer is, it's not that simple because we are dealing with humans, yeah? And humans tend to make mistakes. They tend to make mistakes in normal circumstances, not that often, yeah, every 30 minutes, meantime between failure. But the more complex the environment gets and the more stressful it is, the higher the likelihood of, uh, of, of human error. And that is something that we have to keep in mind. Now, is that a problem? Well, it's not a problem if we talk about this, if it is, if it is addressed, yeah? then it's not an issue. But um, the question is, is it always that easy to speed up? And this is now the challenge uh, that we have to look at. And this would be the main focus of my course to look into the problems that we have in organizations talking about, um, uh, about failure. And just to provide you with uh, some, some data, is it a problem in corporate uh, environments? Well, on the surface, it doesn't seem to be because when we uh, look at surveys, this is one from Millikan Morrison, who did surveys in US companies, it shows 51 per, uh, respondents said, well, in my organization, it's possible to talk about negative things. And another 26% said, well, it's not maybe talking to my boss, not with everybody, but I can talk to people and then the issue will be raised. So overall, 77% who talk about errors. So it seems to be not a big problem, but this is only something that we think we would do going forward. And Millikan Morrison had the hypothesis, well, maybe people are not always acting in that way. And in order to figure out, is that the case, they added a second question. And the question here was not going forward, but reflecting backward. Did you ever encounter a situation where with hindsight, you should have spoken up but you didn't. And guess what? The respondents, 80% of the respondents said, yes, that situation uh, existed. And that should give you some uh, food for thought going forward. We think when it's necessary to talk, it, it may be much harder to do so. Uh, and uh, we um, sometimes keep quiet where it actually would be required to speak up. When I do the, the course, I would, uh, for example, look into um, examples of uh, airline accidents uh, where we have data. Uh, that's not often the case in corporate environments, but in, um, in, in aviation, we have the luxury of having voice recorders in the cockpit. We have flight data recorders. And with this data, we can do a very good analysis of how communication actually takes place uh, in teams with humans. And uh, out of this, we can then um, think about ways of creating an effective communication that allows us to talk about errors, which is the first step for managing them and dealing with them. So that's basically what I do in the course. Final thought, uh, and, and that gives you an, an idea that uh, the whole thing is, is probably worth looking into. I showed you the Lufthansa example where they fired the technicians, but that actually was not the reason why it showed up in the press. The main reason why it showed up in the press was something else. Because when the technicians were fired, there was a harsh reaction from the pilots of Lufthansa. They opposed that management decision and they appealed to the management to say, we actually have to take back that uh, decision because it harms our safety culture, because we depend on speaking up and uh, therefore we need to protect the engineers 
uh, in this case. Yes, they did something wrong, but it's important to have the learning. We need an open speak up culture. And think about for a moment who's taking the risk. It's not the engineers. It's actually the pilots. And the pilot said, don't punish the engineers. So that's something uh, that I would link to and show you why that is and, and how it affected the safety culture in aviation and what it means for corporations. Okay, so thank you very much. And finally, um, uh, that was already mentioned by Marina. If you, in the meantime, like to uh, look a little bit into the, uh, into the stuff I've been doing, I've written two uh, books on this and some articles. Uh, this is, uh, as uh, was said, my main interest. And uh, I'm very happy taking questions. But at this point, I'd like to hand over to Marina. Back to you. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. The lecture was really, really interesting. And this is just a sneak peek uh, into what we have uh, at ESMT. So now I will share some information about uh, ESMT. So uh, who are we? Uh, we are this business school in the middle of Berlin, in the middle of Germany, um, in the economic and political center of uh, Europe. Uh, we create and impart new knowledge to advance business and society. And we develop entrepreneurial leaders who think globally and act locally. Uh, so here on the right side, you can see the facade of our building. Uh, and on the left side, you can see where we are located. So very close to Alexanderplatz here, for those of you who know Berlin. Uh, ESMT is a school focused on leadership, innovation, and analytics. Those three topics uh, come up a lot in all of our MBA programs. And here is the list of our founders and benefactors. Uh, we are also the 1% of the business schools across the globe that have the triple accreditation. And now we are talking about the different MBA options that we offer. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is the ESMT Berlin full-time MBA. The full-time MBA is a very intensive 15-month program that had multiple opportunities to tailor the programs according to your needs, motivations, uh, and goals for your career. We start in January with the core courses, so you will have the foundation of general man management. Uh, that means that we have a very diverse group of students coming from different industries, different uh, backgrounds, uh, different nationalities, and they all uh, have those five months together to really understand the foundation of general management. After this, uh, summer starts and they will have three opportunities to practice their knowledge. Uh, the first one is an internship uh, that can be done in Berlin, in Germany, but can also be done abroad. Uh, we have the Social Impact Project, which is a project of social impact done by the students, usually abroad. Uh, they work as consultants for NGOs. Or if you're already working on your German skills and you plan to stay in the country long-term, you can also take uh, German courses. After this, you have the possibility to choose between uh, managerial analytics or innovation and entrepreneurship, or you can also take one long international exchange in one of our partner schools. After the year is over, then you will start uh, really applying the knowledge that you gained during this year uh, during a consulting project. So this is the full-time MBA. Now the part-time MBA. For those of you who don't want to stop working, uh, that want to achieve an MBA without uh, stop working, we have the part-time MBA. Uh, it's a two-year program, uh, also with uh, general management and a focus on business innovation. The program is divided by modules uh, and it's delivered in a blended format. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, the blended format means that you will have 75% of the lectures being done uh, online and 25% in person across um, residencies uh, in Berlin during the weekend. So you will have residencies from Thursday evening until Saturday. And here you have a quick overview of some of the topics that we cover during this MBA. Now talking about the 
uh, Global Online MBA. So for those of you who cannot attend the residencies in person for the part-time MBA, for example, we offer the Global Online MBA. The Global Online MBA is definitely our most flexible program because it allows you to study anywhere, everywhere. Uh, we have students based in different countries, different continents, and have spread across different time zones. So you will have uh, lectures that you can watch online whenever you have time, but you also have live sessions that you can connect to the faculty members and with your colleagues as well. Uh, everyone starts together in the module one. And then after the first module, you have the opportunity to choose the order of the modules according to uh, your preference or your needs. Sometimes you have a more pressuring uh, problem at work that you would benefit from having one module before the other. So you can choose which module to do next. Uh, we also have the electives. Um, and uh, it's important to say that we have two electives in person. So for those of you who want to do a program online, that want to have this flexibility, but also want to connect with your peers and with ESMT in person, uh, we offer the Berlin Experience Week. So it's a one week uh, elective that takes place here in our campus in Berlin. And we also have the International Experience Week that takes places in different locations depending on the class. So we've had Cape Town, for example, the last one. The next one is going to be in Mexico City. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to meet your colleagues in person and have this uh, networking in person during the MBA. Uh, after this, you have the final project and the graduation that also happens hybridly. So if you can join in person, you're welcome to join the ceremony in Berlin. Otherwise, you can also do the ceremony completely online and get your MBA diploma. Now talking a little bit about the Executive MBA, which is a program uh, designed for senior managers that are looking to go up to C-level positions. Um, it's an 18-month program that um, happens in uh, residential weeks. So you will have 10 modules. Each module is a one-week residency. Uh, six of those modules uh, take place in Berlin, uh, and those are marked here with the uh, white dots. And the orange dots, uh, they mark the modules that take place international. Uh, you will have an overview of responsible leadership, innovation and technology, international management and business integrity. And during this program, you really can uh, develop uh, your responsible leadership. Now, here's a quick overview of the different programs uh, when they start. So the full time starts in January, as I said before. The part time program is a two year program starting in September. The Global Online MBA has uh, two uh, start dates per year. So we have the next one starting in May. In, in May. Applications are open. And we also have uh, in September as well and the executive MBA with classes starting in October. Uh, here we also have an overview of the financing. We have scholarships available for all of the programs. Uh, you can see more information about that on our website. And here, um, a quick overview of the career development team that will support you uh, with the network that we have with different companies, uh, with our alumni as well. Uh, we have several events on campus and online uh, workshops and all the resources for you to develop your career during the MBA. And we also have the career fair. Here uh, are some of the companies that join us for the career fair that happened earlier this year. And uh, here's an overview of the application requirements. So uh, we ask for a CV. Uh, for all of our MBAs, we ask for at least three years of work experience, uh, but seven years for the executive MBA. Uh, we also ask for two professional recommendations and some sort of test score. So we also have our own admissions test, the BAT. Uh, and if applicable, proof of English language as well. Uh, we have all the information on our website as well. If you want to have a look into detail, you can also download a brochure. And here are the upcoming deadlines. So the first round of deadline uh, for the full time is coming up soon. Uh, and we also have other uh, deadlines for the other programs here listed. Uh, so now we can get to the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning 
that uh, we have those sessions with uh, professors every month. Uh, you can check on our website the upcom upcoming sessions. Uh, thank you very much. Now we can get to the questions. So here uh, we have a question from uh, Anonymous uh, to Jan. Uh, what can you recommend to employees in an organization that does not uh, live a proper error culture uh, and how to enable employees to speak up? Uh, so uh, Jan, this, this is a question for you. Yeah. Well, that's um, a typical question. And unfortunately, there, there's obviously no easy answer to this because if, if you have a, uh, a company that does not provide a level of safety uh, uh, and, and one of the core elements for uh, speak up culture is the concept of psychological safety. You, you may have uh, heard about that uh, before. That's not something that you can demand. That's not something that you can create yourself um, uh, and, and um, uh, protecting yourself. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be quiet. One of the ways of, of um, addressing things that you see and, and you would like to talk about is uh, asking questions. Um, simply ask, well, I see this, how, how should I interpret this or something like that? So in, instead of saying, well, you did something wrong or something is, is, is a problem here, first ask a question. And, and often by just raising an issue, you address that. Um, if you figure out it's it's not working, you can escalate. And and one way to escalate is to say to to bring yourself in and say, well, I'm concerned. I think this might lead to this and so on. So therefore you you may be able to raise the awareness still without putting blame on people. Yeah. And and um then um uh, finally if if something is is really uh getting seriously out of control, you really have to say, okay, well. I think this is going to damage us. This is going to have a serious impact and address it uh, directly. But often uh, it is enough to simply ask and then things get get moving. Um, so, and uh, from a leader perspective, if you're a bit more senior, um, uh, again, you may not get psychological safety from your superiors, but at least you can create uh, psychological safety uh, downward in your organization. And why should you do that? Well, simply because you get information. Yeah, If you provide psychological safety, if you encourage speaking up, you get information that you would otherwise not get. So that's uh, these are uh, some of the things that could be done. I hope that answers the question. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just give one more minute because we already passed our time by five minutes. Uh, so I'll give one last minute in case someone has a question. Um, here, uh, hello from Israel. Thank you for the session and information. Thank you very much, Yao, for joining the session. Um, here, uh, speaking of Gomba, so, um, oh, yes, this is a question that we get a lot about the, the Gomba diploma. So if you have, if you have a global online MBA diploma, um, our MBA diplomas are the same. So regardless if you do the part-time, the full-time, um, the online, you will receive the same diploma. Uh, the diploma is the same as an MBA diploma, MBA degree uh, with all the certifications that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but on the academic transcripts, then you will have the modality of studies. Then it will be uh, said if it was a part-time program or a full-time program, if it was delivered online or in person. Uh, but the diploma that you have, the degree is the same. Um, and the experience of our, our alumni so far has been great. Uh, so we just had our first class graduating last October. And even before graduation, um, a considerable number of students, they either got promotions or they changed jobs and even, even changed locations. So we have students, for example, who started a program in Japan and moved to Germany. Uh, one student that moved from Spain to the Netherlands. So there was uh, a lot of uh, career advancement during and after the program as well. Uh, and here, uh, for a fresh graduate to join the full-time MBA, 
unfortunately, we have this uh, criteria that is three years of work experience because we understand that uh, what you get from the program as an experienced professional will be different than if you just get out of college. Uh, but we do have master uh, programs that are designed for uh, recent graduates. So I would advise you to have a look. Uh, we have our master in global management that uh, is also focused on general and international management. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we are reaching the uh, end of the session. Alina, Sorry. I, Marina, I think there's one more raised hand from uh, Austin uh, that I see here. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, hi, Austin. <coughs> yeah, hi. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Hello, Professor Jen Hagen. Okay, yeah, my question is, um, what, what, what are the career prospects for someone who um, passes through the full-time MBA program. And um, if, 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 if one were to do that, just like what was obtainable in the US, some programs are STEM designated, which gives you optional OPT training for three, for three years. Is, is that also applicable when, is that also applicable in Germany? If I come to ESMT Berlin for my full-time MBA, will I have the opportunity of working in Germany for some period of years? Thank you very much for the wonderful session. Thank you very much, Hussein. I think I can uh, take this one regarding uh, career after graduation. So, um, yeah, so we do have um, four full-time MBAs who graduate. Uh, they can stay up to 18 months after graduation with what we call job-seeking visa. So this is a visa that uh, every person that graduated in Germany can have. Uh, during these 18 months, you have the possibility to look for a job and even to work uh, in any industry, any job role, uh, can be part-time, full-time. So it's a very flexible visa in this aspect. Usually what happened to most of our students, I have to say actually over 92% of the students who graduate uh, from the full-time MBA, they end up working in Germany afterwards. So the usually... The case is that after graduation, they find a job. And if they would like to stay in Germany, they can just uh, change to a work visa afterwards. And the process is fairly simple uh, if you're an MBA graduate. So thank you very much, everyone. We are wrapping up the session now. Uh, and have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you're located. Thank you. Thank you once again, Jan. OK, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.